Um, welcome to Parliament Buildings, of these, those of you who are here today and those of you who are live streaming in to the event. It's wonderful that we now are so um, familiar with these hybrid models of events and allows them so many more people to um, not only listen in, but obviously contribute here today. My name is Paula Bradshaw, um, Alliance Party MLA in South Belfast, and probably most notably for today, I sit on the ad hoc committee for Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. We are, we're still working away at it, and I know certainly people in this room have contributed to this process, so my um, thanks to you on behalf of the committee as deputy chair, but also from the party's point of view. Um, as I say, welcome to Parliament Building, especially those of you who have never been here before. It's great to see people back in person. And um, I just have a few comments, uh, opening comments to make. And then unfortunately, I have some business in the um, chamber that I'll have to leave for. So I say thank you um, and to the Bingham Rule of Law Centre, Committee on the Administration of Justice and Queen's University Belfast School of Law for organising an important event at this time. You did not all come here to listen to me and I'm here to welcome you as sponsor um, so as to enable the real experts to do the talking. However, I think in the context of, it is important that I add just a few words from our own political standpoint. The UK government's proposals represent a dramatic change of policy away from the Stormont House Agreement, which, imperfect though it was, represented the closest we were likely to get of an all-party agreement on dealing with the past. It is my view and that of my party um, that it is entirely unacceptable that the UK government would simply ride, ride roughshod over the past agreement, which itself oversaw in this manner. All five parties represented in the executive have opposed this change. Worst of all is the extreme anxiety and concern it has caused to victims and survivors themselves and to those advocating on their behalf, absolutely none of whom endorse what the UK government is proposing. Here today, we are going to hear from some of the foremost experts in the field of human rights, justice and the rule of law. I cannot speak for, for them, but I suspect they too will share the view with clear and indisputable um, evidence that what the UK government is proposing will, far from ending the suffering, only serve to cause further harm. One of the reasons it will cause further harm, in my view, is that what is proposed runs fundamentally contrary to the rule of law itself. My political party is founded on the rule of law. For us, it is not just a principle, it is a purpose. In fact, in the 1998 agreement specifically, it specifically prevents the Northern Ireland Assembly from passing any law which is contrary to the European Convention rights. One basic purpose of this is to prevent the passage of any law which itself runs contrary to the rule of law. In the UK government's command paper, we see sweeping proposals to usurp this by closing down due legal process and thus, in my view, to challenge the rule of law itself. The fact that legacy cases are sensitive, complex and difficult is not a reason to stop taking them on. On the contrary, it is the very reason we need a process through which to take them on. Legacy ultimately impacts on all, all of us and on the society in which we live. The simple fact is that, we, that if we do not deal with the past in a managed way, we will end up dealing with it in an unmanaged way. The rule of law is central in how we do the former. The UK government knows this, which is why it is less than transparent about the contents of its proposals in the command paper. The drip feed, including the later announcement of the closure of the historical institutions, sorry, investigations unit, um, to make prosecutions impossible, is simply another profound breach of trust, as well as a severe blow to continuing those continuing to seek truth, justice and accountability. The UK government urgently needs to return to the pr principles of the 1998 agreement and recognise that we cannot base our continued processing of the past and indeed of our future on the rule, sorry, if we cannot um, on the rule of law, we will have little less else to base it on. We will continue to engage to seek a restoration of the Stormont House Agreement and ultimately the rule of law as our starting point. So thank you and enjoy your conference. Thank you.
Thank you for that, Paula. Uh, my name is Kieran McAvoy. Um, I'm a professor in the School of Law and I work in Queens and I work in the Mitchell Institute as well. And myself and my colleague, Dr. Anna Bryson are co-chairing the event today. I'm gonna to do some context setting remarks. Um, and as, as everyone's aware, this is an event organized by ourselves at Queens, by the Committee and Administration of Justice and by the Center for the Rule of Law, uh, the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law. Um, and you're gonna hear more about that later. Um, so I'm gonna be pretty tight in the chairing of this folks. And um, so I'm gonna sit, after I make my own introductory remarks, I'm gonna sit in your eye line for the speakers. And I'll catch, I think we're, we're all aiming, hopefully we can, for about 10 minutes each to leave um, space for comments and questions and at the end. The way for, I know we have a big online audience, and the way that we're taking questions for that is if you put your questions in the chat bar on on, on the uh, on your computer, and then Anna, my colleague, will will um, bring those in for us. Um, so some context setting remarks. Oh, I should also say this is being recorded. So, um, so be conscious of that when you're when you're making your remarks. So, a bit of background on us, the model the model build team. So, we're a team based in Queens and the Committee Administration of Justice. Um, since 2013-14, we have been providing free technical and legal advice to all um, anyone with a, an interest in legacy. So that's um, all five political parties, the British and Irish governments, victims organisations, um, former security force personnel, the army, and um, the police, and basically anyone with an interest. Our view is that. These are, these are complex and technical matters and people need to make up their own mind on how they feel about them, but to be as informed as possible in, 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 in so doing. And so that's what we've been doing. In 2020, um, we produced um, a document which benchmarked all of the proposals that had been put out there. Obviously our starting place in all of this is human rights compliance, the Stormont House Agreement and the Good Friday Agreement. And so we benchmarked everything that was in the public space at that juncture um, against those, those three criteria. But we also in that suggested what we thought, recognizing that the government had a particular political problem around veterans. And we proposed in addition to implementing the Stormont House Agreement, in effect that the, the two year maximum for sentences for conflict related offenses could be reduced lawfully in our view to zero. Um, and we put that out for, for public discussion. And um, more recently, we've also done a, a very detailed critique um, which is available online on our website there, dealing with the past in Northern Ireland and um, .com. And for, for people who are present here, I have some hard copies of that critique as well. If anybody's old school like me and likes an actual report, um, they can they can take that away with it. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that. This is just context setting for the conversation to come. Um, in so in um, the most recent critique. Um, we uh, go through what are the binding legal standards um, around um, amnesties and also um, the, the duty to investigate. I think we'll hear more about that, particularly Article 2 and Article 3 violations. Um, for non-lawyers, Article 2 is the right to life. Article 3 um, relates to torture and human and degrading treatment. Um, obviously, an amnesty conflicts with those binding legal obligations. In a moment, we're going to hear from the UN Special Rapporteur on Transitional Justice exactly how that conflicts. There is space within the law, within the European uh, Convention framework for an amnesty, but that space requires um, that it must be necessary, and that's a high threshold in the, in the current context, we're talking at least 23 years after the conflict formally ended, and where the rights of victims to information recovery and reparations and so forth are respected, and again, for us, we think the command paper is falling well, well, short of, well short of meeting those um, legal standards. Um, Another piece of work we've done is our colleague Louise Malander happens to be basically the world authority on amnesties. And so we, um, Louise had set up an amnesty database with every amnesty on it since 1945. And again, it's quite fortunate that we were able to benchmark um, the current government's proposed amnesty against all of these um, existing amnesties. There's 659 odd in that database. And um, in the comparative work, she looked at the more recent ones from 1990, 289 of them from 1990 um, until 2016, um, to look at where Boris's amnesty fits basically legally, what it looks like in terms of law and practice for other states. So first of all, it's rare to get, this is an unconditional amnesty that's being proposed. So that's relatively rare. Only 37% of the amnesties that she looked at had were, were uh, unconditional. Uh, Boris is, uh, excludes no crimes. That's highly unusual to not exclude, you know, the most serious crimes, you know, genocide, um, war crimes, and so forth. Only 6% sought to prevent civil remedies, as people will be aware, and the current the government command paper is planning to close down um, legacy-related civil actions, so 94% of amnesties don't try to do that. Um, none tried to prevent inquests that we could find. None attempted to prevent the inquests. And none are granted 23 years after conflict. As I said, legally, it it's supposed to be necessary. This is 23 years after the conflict, so this is this is a standalone. And to give you a sense of 
just how it stands out. We, we, I teach this stuff. And so we, the, the normal go-to place that you would um, use for teaching um, what is the most egregious amnesty you can find is, funnily enough, one introduced by Augusto Pinochet, Chilean um, a, a dictator. Um, very, very thoroughly nasty regime. And so we went and looked at a bit of detail at Pinochet's amnesty just to get a sense in order to benchmark it um, across. And Boris's amnesty is significantly worse than Pinochet's. It is, um, as one uh, unionist politician described at an event we spoke at, Pinochet plus. Uh, this, is, this amnesty is, 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 is Pinochet plus. Um, and so, for example, Pinochet has sought to exclude certain egregious offences. There are no egregious offences um, in the proposed command paper. Uh, Pinochet's amnesty only applied to the first five years of the dictatorship. There are no temporal limits on, 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 in, in the command paper on this. Um, the uh, Pinochet one did not attempt to um, mess with cases that were already in the system, basically, to mess with cases that were already in the system. Obviously, this, this explicitly is designed to close down cases that are, are already in, in the system. And, and Pinochet's amnesty only applied to criminal cases. Um, and this one obviously applies not just to criminal cases, not just to prosecution, but to inquest and civil acts. So it is rightly um, seen as Pinochet plus. Um, the other aspect to all of this, and I guess we'll hear more about this, is the command paper also includes details of a proposed information recovery body, um, a, a, a body that's designed to provide information to families. The key element to that, obviously, is what are the legal powers of that body? Will it have the legal teeth to deliver. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of detail on this now, but just having read it very closely, um, our view is that what is being proposed will not provide the legal teeth to enable families' rights, their Article 2 rights and, and potentially Article 3 rights, to be upheld. Um, the teeth are not there. This will be a toothless uh, information recovery body. So I also received um, information, an update on figures from the um, DPP's office on Friday, just to give you a sense of, of who will benefit um, from this proposed amnesty at the moment. So currently, in, in, according to DPP, um, in terms of live conflict-related prosecutions that are before the courts, there are two Republican suspect, two loyalists, and one, one military, one soldier. Um, there are pending prosecutions, and this excludes the Operation Canova um, investigation on, um, being undertaken um, by John Boucher. Um, and so excluding that, there are five Republicans, two loyalists, three military, and two police. The government rightly came to the view that they could not introduce a state actor only amnesty. I think, I mean, I think there was a lot of discussion for a number of years around this, but they rightly concluded that that was not viable. This is why we have an amnesty that is applying to both state and non-state actors. But to be explicit, this means if these numbers, these numbers may shift, I guess, depending on the time frame for the introduction of the legislation. But this means that ministers are going to be standing at a dispatch box and um, arguing in favor of an amnesty that is. The, the majority of the beneficiaries are going to be the non-state actors, Republicans and loyalists, um, rather than, than, than state actors. From our perspective, there's workable solutions out there. There are ways in which the Stormont House Agreement is our benchmark for starting everything. Um, and there is there are ways in which you could implement the Stormont House Agreement, you could keep the civil inquest, keep keep civil cases, keep inquests running, um, and you could uphold the rule of law. And actually, you could also have prosecutions so that families would at least have their day in court, um, but you could at, um, use an administrative mechanism to reduce the jail time from uh, two years max to zero. That is, there is a workable solution out there. But for us, the command paper will not work legally, it will not work morally, and it will not work politically. So now we're going to play a very short video um, from the, special, the UN Special Rapporteur on Transitional Justice, um, Fabian Salvioli. Hello, everybody. My name is Fabian Salvioli. I am the Special Rapporteur of the United Nations on the promotion of truth, justice, reparations, and warranties of non-recurrences. Um, I would like, first of all, to thank the organizers, the Bingham Center and the Dealing with the Past team for the invitation to participate in this event at the Northern Ireland Assembly to discuss the recent proposals by the United Kingdom government on dealing with legacy issues arising out of the conflict in Northern Ireland. As I said, I am the special rapporteur on the promotion of truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees on non recurrences of the United Nations. So my main role is focused on dealing with the past issues, supervising and monitoring processes of transitional justice and their compliance with international human rights law standards. As part of the mandate, I conduct country visits, provide technical assistance, and I report each year to the Human Rights Council and to the UN General Assembly. Because the UK proposal, I send a communication to the United Kingdom government. 
and I have expressed serious concern about the plan to ban all prosecutions, impede investigations, and preclude victims' civil claims in connection with the troubles in Northern Ireland, which would effectively institute a de facto amnesty and blanket impunity for the grave human rights violations committed during that period. The proposal will ban all conflict-related prosecutions through the introduction of a statute of limitation to apply equally to all troubles related incidents. It would not apply to cases already adjudicated, but under the proposal, the police service and the police ombudsman of Northern Ireland will be statutorily barred from investigating troubles related incidents and judicial activity would be ended across the spectrum of criminal cases and current and future civil cases and inquests. This would effectively also preclude coronial inquests and victims' claims in civil courts. The proposal will bring an immediate end to criminal investigations into troubles related offenses and remove the prospect of prosecutions that forecloses the pursuit of justice and accountability for the serious human rights violations committed during the troubles and frustrate victims' rights to truth and to an effective remedy for the harm suffered, placing the United Kingdom in flagrant violations of its international obligations. If you can see um, the guidelines and the standards on accountability, you can see my last report presented this year to um, the Human Rights Council on that issue. Reconciliation never ever is a consequence of impunity. Criminal justice is an essential pillar on transitional justice processes alongside truth thickens. I would like to recall the importance of adopting a comprehensive approach in a transitional justice processes that incorporates the full range of judicial and non-judicial measures. The essentials component of a transitional justice approach, truth, justice, reparation, memorialization, and warranties of non-recurrences cannot be traded off against one another in a pick and choose exercise. The truth is both an individual and a collective rights. Victims and society have the rights to truth and all proposals must have the consideration for the victims and their full consent according the international standards. The state must adopt measures for establishing the full extent of the truth about the human rights violations perpetrated during the troubles and about the circumstances, reasons, and responsibilities that led to them. Concerning apologies, the framework for the provision of public apologies is again the international human rights law. And you can find some guidelines on the nature and content of the apology, the responsibilities acknowledged in relation to the violations committed, the author and context of the apology, and the consultation with victims in the design of the apology in my report presented to the United Nations General Assembly in October 2019. You can find it in the website of the mandate. I express also concern because the lack of clarity concerning the role that victims will play in the design, implementation, and monitoring of the proposed transitional justice institutions and measures, including those relating to memorization, archiving, and trust recovery, and how their full and effective participation will be warranted. 
truth, justice, full reparation, warranties of non recurrences and memorialization processes are not a choice. They are international obligation. And just following the way of the international human rights law, the reconciliation and the solid and just peace will be rigid. I thank you very much. Um, thank you for that. Um, just before I introduce the next speaker, I just wanted to, to make one quick point. Um, so that uh, the work that Fabian's talking about on apologies, um, as, as he makes clear in that report, Anna and I actually work closely with Fabian and his colleagues on producing that report. And the, the clear thing to come out of that is that there is a role for apologies and acknowledgement as being complementary to other processes, to um, potentially prosecutions, but certainly to truth and reparations. And so apologies is not a soft option um, alternative to um, upholding the rule of law, prosecutions, truth, and so forth. It's a complementary process. So anyway, I, I want to introduce our next speaker. So you've heard there from the, the, the United Nations. Um, I want to now introduce one of the most distinguished local um, human rights lawyers in the jurisdiction, Alison Kirkpatrick, who's the Chief Commissioner of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. Thanks, Kieran. Time is limited today, and this is a huge uh, subject. It merits really sensitive, comprehensive treatment. Um, I'm going to have to be brief, and because of that, I'm going to confine my comments to points of general application. And at the end, you might say, um, tell us something we don't know, um, and you may be right to. But what I've found, particularly recently, is that um, the obvious has become very elusive. Common sense is becoming rare indeed, and generally accepted principles seem to be disputed. I feel like I have to keep restating them. I thought we'd be beyond this by now. Um, and I'm restating them with only sometimes to keep them in my own mind. Before I say anything further, I should also say that um, what I'm saying today is from my own professional experience. I don't offer this on behalf of the Commission um, itself, not least because the Commission has not been asked to advise yet, we hope yet, uh, in, relation, in relation to all of this. We will, of course, offer advice um, when we receive a um, clearer idea of the proposals. What I can tell you, however, um, about the Commission's position is that it expects any forthcoming um, law or policy to be human rights compliant. And maybe if I tell you a little bit about what I think that means, uh, you might get a little bit of a steer about where the uh, Commission is going. So having got that sort of protective statement out of the way, um, let me share a few observations. Across the island, uh, the legacy of the past and the state's involvement in allegations about, uh, uh, the, rather the state's treatment of allegations about its involvement in rights violations has put enormous strain on uh, public relations. Can I move that? There's a little machine there and I wasn't quite sure what it was about to do. Um, and it, it's vital um, that this is seen for what it is. Because a failure to apply rights principles to everyone all of the time is what casts doubt on all security measures and systems and on those providing security. It risks alienating the public from the very systems put in place uh, to protect them, and it risks undermining confidence in the state and the rule of law itself. And when one considers the theme of this event, it could just as easily, uh, sadly, be framed as truth or justice or the rule of law question mark. And that reveals immediately uh, the discomfort at the heart of this debate. There's a danger that current rhetoric around legacy forces people to do exactly that, to choose. Uh, and I note the special rapporteur said, this is not a choice, but that's exactly what people are being asked to do. The concepts of truth, justice, and the rule of law are interdependent. They cannot be mutually exclusive. Surely we're not asking that of people to accept these as mutually exclusive. Truth and justice and the rule of law have long been the very basis of our values over centuries, foundation of democracy itself. Real democracy values everyone equally by securing the protection of the essential rights of members of minority groups, even when they're unpopular. And if anyone thinks they know who is currently unpopular or who makes up the minority group, I can uh, reassure you almost certainly wrong because at any time, any one of us um, is vulnerable to being in the minority, to being on the wrong side uh, of any particular issue. And I ask myself, you know, have we really got to that place in Northern Ireland 
where one principle is sacrificed at the expense of another, where one person's rights are subservient uh, to another's. And I, my fear is that we might just be moving to that very position, but we mustn't abandon, at least not easily, the pursuit of truth and justice and the rule of law. If you abandon one, you abandon them all. I don't often find myself quoting the Bishop of Salisbury, but uh, I will. I was very impressed by a speech he made recently. He said this, truth and justice are the touchstones of the rule of law. Those responsible for upholding the law are to be about the truth and seek justice, even when it is difficult and personally costly. I don't think anyone can take issue with that. So that should remain at the back of minds when looking at any future proposals. And we don't need to, we shouldn't need to, and we shouldn't be made to feel guilty uh, for holding the state and all emanations of the state to account for the delivery of all three. We are not surely so in incompetent and fractured as a society to not be able to find a resolution that meets the needs of everyone most directly affected. And I look at what has been achieved already in Northern Ireland, it's, we know far from perfect, um, but inconceivable when I was growing up in Belfast that we would be where we are now. I just hope it's inconceivable that we should be where perhaps um, other people are pointing us in the next five or 10 years. I do accept, and I think we have to accept that whether one feels truth and justice have been uh, delivered can be influenced by one's subjective position on things. But society and those governing and those uh, entrusted with making decisions and making laws must be clear about what that is and how they're going to deliver it. They must make it clear that it's worth pursuing. A truth in this context, uh, it seems to me, is not just a record um, of the way the world actually was at any uh, time, what happened when, although it needs to at the very least encompass those things. The United Nations um, talks about the right to truth as a matter of international law, um, and that is becoming established as a, a very strong international legal principle. And what they say is that you're entitled to know the full and complete truth as to the events that transpired, their specific circumstances, who participated in them, including knowing the circumstances in which the violations took place, as well as the reasons for them. That goes way beyond simply a story or a chronology. The UN recognizes the right to truth as a fundamental right under the law and explains it is grounded in the need of the victims, their relatives and general society to know the truth about what has taken place, to facilitate the reconciliation process, to contribute to the fight against impunity, and to reinstall and strengthen democracy and the rule of law. And each element of that is critical. It's not just, as they say, an agreed story of events, but a process that is aimed at achieving reconciliation, removing impunity, and protecting the rule of law. The UN has considered specifically the right to truth in the context of blanket uh, amnesties uh, and others hear no more about that probably than I, so I'll leave that to them. But what they made clear is that it cannot block the re revelation of the truth. And this right extends well beyond uh, the UN. Practically every international body is agreed, um, every international body concerned with human rights, certainly, including the Council of Europe uh, has recognized the right to truth. We also need truth in th this very debate about legacy and consideration of government proposals to, in quotes, deal with the past. And that means if new laws are proposed, and we know they're considering them, but we haven't seen what they are, we need to have it explained to us exactly what their purpose is, against what evidence they have been considered, what reasons are given for those laws, and what is their likely impact. And that's the least anyone can expect uh, with any new law, but particularly one which contemplates bypassing the established law, the rule of law and human rights. Justice uh, is defined in law as the proper administration of the law, the fair and equitable treatment of all indiv individuals under the law, or a more narrow interpretation might be it requires the recognition and implementation of laws made by the legislature. But the rule of law is a much broader concept, which depends on truth and justice first. The rule of law is not the existence of detailed laws, duly enacted and scrupulously observed. A government with enough power can legislate for almost anything. It might be lawful, but is it in accordance with the rule of law? Not if you believe that the law must afford adequate protection uh, to fundamental human rights. If the letter of the law does not protect human rights, then the rule of law is itself stripped of its very principle. And that was how Lord uh, Bingham, uh, Bingham Centre and the rule of law is a, a terrific institution. I just want to uh, give a shout out to Lord Bingham, who became something of a judicial uh, crush of mine. Um, 
a thoroughly decent but terrific lawyer. And this is the way he looked at it in his book on the rule of law. Law cannot be simply what is dictated by political authority or issued by the state. He went on, it must be accepted that the outer edges of some fundamental human rights are not clear cut, but there is ordinarily a large measure of agreement on where the lines are to be drawn at any particular time. And ultimately the courts are there to draw the lines. Now, my reading of the command paper is that none of that is met. Uh, should, were we to ask across the UK whether this feels right, whether there's an agreed position in relation to how you deal with um, unsolved murders and um, serious human rights violations, I suspect you will get an agreement, but it's not going to be reflected in the command paper. Moreover, the courts aren't going to be there to draw the lines for us. That's expressly what is uh, contemplated. So in Northern Ireland, we've learned that a failure by security services to protect rights and even to violate rights themselves results in diminution in respect for that rule of law. It never stopped violence, it never will. Extraordinary methods and techniques outside of the law didn't work and they won't work. They don't protect people from harm. Here, the security services lost support and therefore their greatest weapon against terrorism and crime, which was access to critical intelligence from the community. And that was a lesson hard come by over decades. And I wonder, has that been forgotten? Going back to Lord Bingham, when referring to the rights protected by the Human Rights Act 1998 in particular, which I remind is an act of the UK Parliament, he described those as truly fundamental in the sense that they are guarantees which no one living in a free democratic society such as the UK or Ireland should be required to forego. In Northern Ireland, policing reform became a central focus in the talks about peace. Reform of policing was a key component of that delicate peace process. And adherence to human rights uh, was to be both foundation of and reinforcement for that uh, delicate uh, process and to hold it all together. The assumption then was that the state, the police, the security agencies would welcome oversight, uh, accountability and embrace transparency. Not that they might avoid uh, the law or change it retrospectively uh, when it didn't suit. And it seems to me that protection of public safety and security in Northern Ireland was best achieved by the protection of fundamental freedoms and by protection and respect for the rule of law. I don't think that's changed. Legacy was relevant to the peace process. It continues to be relevant now. And in the assessment of the police themselves, it's holding back progress and undermining trust. It's too important to overlook. It doesn't seem um, like there's any moving on from it. Police not as things stand deserve serious treatment within the law and in good faith. In the context of the law and legacy, everyone knows and often uses the shorthand of Article 2. Um, and Kieran has said Article 2 means the right to life under the European Convention. But that can mean uh, it's seen as something less tangible than good old law enacted by a sovereign uh, government. And that's why I think it's important to remember, as I pointed out earlier, that it, it is the Human Rights Act itself, an act of parliament, which makes it law. Article 2 is expressly enacted uh, in this jurisdiction. It means any public authority which doesn't comply with it is acting unlawfully. Human Rights Act prohibits the taking of life unless absolutely necessary to defend another uh, person's life. And central to that, to ensure that's, that's right, you have to investigate if a life is taken. And that fits with the common laws developed over centuries. Courts are very comfortable with them um, applying that principle. Under Article 2, it means essentially four things. The state must not take life without justification. It must protect us from others taking our life. If life has been taken, there must be an effective official investigation independent of those implicated, which is capable of holding perpetrators to account and that the family and close relatives, and I would add society, uh, are entitled to know what happened and that lessons have been learned to prevent it happening again. Now the question of whether victims and relatives of the deceased, have you been waiting all that time? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think you ran over too. I'm going to be very quick. I'm, I'm nearly finished. Um, the question of whether victims and relatives of the deceased are entitled uh, to know the identity of the perpetrator is a tricky, uh, it's a more tricky one to answer uh, within the law. But there is uh, support across the international community that um, supports the principle of the right to know the perpetrator. There is an issue, however, and this is often used in relation to proposals such as these, that the um, alleged perpetrator does not get access to due process and therefore their human rights are breached. What the human rights standards tell us is that the right to truth addressed in the uh, frame of criminal judicial proceedings or other civil proceedings, if appropriate, um, 
where that is the case, there is no um, uh, conflict between due process and the right to truth, principle of presumption of innocence. Perpetrators can be named so long as they've been put through uh, the uh, judicial process. What we have at the minute is a situation where it doesn't suit even suspects or alleged perpetrators because they're not going to be subject to any proper judicial process and their Article 6 rights of fair trial are not going to be um, protected either. And I'd simply remind you um, in passing that the police ombuds ombudsman's powers already are quite limited as to what she can say um, because she hasn't conducted a criminal investigation which has been tested in court. So finishing off, um, I'd say truth seeking is not a substitute to justice and the rule of law. Justice is not a substitute to truth and the rule of law. And in any event, none of these things will result in uh, the truth if abandoned. The current conversation about legacy starts from the received uh, wisdom. One, many things have been tried, and two, all have failed. And just from my personal experience um, in the last few years, I can tell you I could not disagree more strongly with both parts of that. There's been no real attempt, not yet. Uh, for example, there's been no process set up, never mind tried to implement Stormont House. Some cases have gone through the criminal justice system, but not concluded with convictions or even trials in some cases. But that doesn't mean they've failed. It doesn't mean the process failed. It certainly doesn't mean other cases are bound to fail. The criminal justice process can be difficult, doesn't always yield results, but we would never in any other situation contemplate, aban contemplate abandoning it uh, because some cases might fail. In some cases, a withdrawal or, or acquittal may be the right result. It shows the safeguards worked. So before jumping to assume the criminal justice process is unable to deal with uh, these cases, look at what happened in those cases that did fail. In none of the cases was it suggested by anybody with any credibility or evidence that the investigation or prosecution was vexatious. So I question the very foundation uh, of this um, proposal. And I really am finishing now. I just want to, it would be remiss not to mention a, an example of something that does work, but is being confused, I think, uh, and used as a substitute um, for a wider legacy process. Um, Operation Canova, which has been mentioned uh, under the leadership of uh, former Chief Constable John Boucher, and I carried out a review of Operation Canova. What I would say about Canova is that at the same time as conducting a high class criminal investigation, what John Boucher has done is secure confidence of those directly affected, whether from policing, military or other backgrounds, and I spoke to people from all of those backgrounds. It is being cited as a good model, but it seems to me it's been, that has been given lip service because one has to really look at what Canova does. If it is meant that it's a good model, then ask John Boucher what has made it a success and ask the people who've engaged with him what has made it a success. It certainly uh, wouldn't get the same outcome, in my view, and I think in John Boucher's view, without power to obtain evidence to compel it, test it, and put it into the public domain. He succeeded because he knows and applies human rights law as it is. We don't need a new um, shiny piece of law. He describes it as good police work. Why not let him finish and prove or disprove? Uh, the Canova families were not, it has not impeded reconciliation by being involved in Canova. It has not re-traumatized them in my experience, although some may tell me differently, but it did give them the dignity back and pulling investigations, refusing to contemplate allowing cases to go forward may well impede reconciliation and re-traumatize them. So if, if the government is committed to not doing those things, then it needs to think uh, again, in my view. Instead, yeah. Um, instead of treating people um, with respect to the dignity as human rights law requires, what is, I suspect, happening is that we are demanding that those who've suffered the most uh, are dignified in the face of uh, violations. We are asking them to have dignified silence. And in my view, silence is never dignified in circumstances like this. So let me just end with the words of Dominic Raab, uh, Secretary of State for Justice and Lord Chancellor, and these can give us some hope for the future. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated a number of negative trends, including the erosion of human rights and democracy in different parts of the world. It has provided an opportunity for unscrupulous and opportunistic governments to increase repression and flight international law. It continues, we are confident and ambitious about our role as a protector of human rights and a beacon of democratic sovereignty. He pledges to continues to defend the international rule of law and, <laughs> and the rights and freedoms of the most oppressed and most vulnerable around the world. 
This is a mission of Global Britain as a force for good. Against this backdrop, the UK played a critical role as a champion of open democratic societies, human rights, and the rule of law. And I would simply remind um, Mr. Rabb what the UN Special Rapporteur said that the world thinks of us at the minute, and that is we are in flagrant breach of our obligations. If you apply the logic in that quote, Dominic Rabb's logic, one can only result in a human rights-based approach to these legacy cases, which values truth and justice and the rule of law, and which in turn pays respect to the dignity of all those who've been hurt. I'm sorry I went over. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Alison. Um, our next speaker, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be quite interventionist um, for speakers to come. Um, I was quite interventionist there too. Um, uh, next speaker is Alan McBride. Alan will be known to many. He's a senior manager in, in the WAVE Trauma Centre. Alan, up to you. I might actually be under. Um, and if I go over, I'll definitely be under. I think that's the, the message to take from that, Karen. Um, okay, so thanks for the invite. Uh, I suppose just as I was listening, and I've been listening for over 20 years, and I was listening during the COP26 thing, and this phrase, blah, 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 that uh, Greta Thunberg uh, sort of came up with, I kind of wonder if it kind of applies to the conversation that we've been having, because it seems to me that it's been going on for a hell of a long time, and there's been absolutely nothing of any satisfaction, really, that has resulted for victims and for survivors. So blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure, I'm not suggesting what you said was blah, 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 um, but there's a lot of blah, blah, blah. Sandra was to be here today giving this uh, talk, uh, but she had to go to a funeral uh, this morning of uh, Patsy McAteer, who was the sister of Seamus Ruddy, uh, that, that when it disappeared, that passed away. And Patsy's death actually is the fifth person um, that we have buried in the last two weeks. Uh, and I think that ought to send out a very powerful message that time is not of the essence here. Uh, this issue of dealing with legacy, dealing with the past needs to be sorted now. Uh, we can't wait another four or five years. So I hope that that kind of just would try to uh, concentrate minds to getting something sorted out. Like most NGOs, uh, that we have trauma center that I work for uh, and human rights organizations and political parties are totally opposed uh, to the government's uh, command paper. Uh, we think what's uh, described in there falls far short of Stormont House Agreement and of anything that any of the previous initiatives um, have come up with. And we have been uh, involved in lots of these initiatives going back over our 30 year uh, uh, presence, uh, right back from the HCR report in 2002, the ELOS report in 2003, Eames Bradley, House of Sullivan, the Extorial Inquiries team, Stormont House Agreement, Fresh Start, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it just goes on. So when I think about what's important to victims and survivors, and to be honest with you, I'm not a legal person. I'm aware that I'm in a room with a lot of heavyweight legal people. I'm not legal at all. The only thing that works for me is it works for families, to be honest with you. And I think it's up to the legal people to try to create a framework uh, to make that happen. Okay, so all my comments are based on literally what works for families. And when I think about that, I think of things like trust. I think trust is extremely important. Uh, and not all of the initiatives that have been put in place to date have had that. The, uh, HET had it in part, but didn't have it in its totality. And uh, trust, I think, is, is extremely, extremely important. Uh, victims and survivors, when they're coming forward and they're telling you their story and what happened to them, they need to know uh, that the person at the other side of the table um, is interested, is compassionate, and that they believe in, in what they're being told. We also believe that there has to be a continuity of care. Uh, so the notion that investigators can come in and out of a family's life really doesn't work for families. I think they need to have someone that can actually stay the course, that can actually go the distance. And we think that's extremely important as well. The process needs to be victim-centered. Uh, and that's a phrase that we hear a lot of, victim-centered. We need to make these processes victim-centered. And yet, uh, to be honest with you, quite a number of the processes that have been put in place or that have come up have been anything but victim-centered. Uh, or if they are victim centered, they're kind of just tokenistic in terms of you get a couple of victims into the room and hear what they say. Um, and then you can tick that box that they're victim centered. The processes absolutely need to be victim centered. And I'm saying that, and yet at the same time, I realize that there is no one voice for victims. There is no one thing that victims want. They want the whole, a whole range of things, which is why things like Ames Bradley House of Sullivan and Dave Stormont House uh, came up with a menu of options. And we think that that's, that that's significant and important. And we need to, need to listen to that. The process, whatever's put in place, and particularly around truth and justice, that the people involved in it need to be accountable. Uh, uh, they need to be accountable to perhaps a, 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 
uh, some of their peers or, or, or to others, international people, um, but that accountability is absolutely essential. And then we come to truth. Um, one of the things I think that bothers me most about the government's command paper is this notion that perpetrators can come and almost have the last word on what happened uh, in a certain atrocity. So you're relying on people to come forward and tell you the truth, or at least what they want you to know is the truth. Um, but I believe fundamentally that the truth needs to be interrogated. Uh, I don't believe that we should just be accepting the word of perpetrators for what happened. And I was very privileged um, not so long ago when Justice Keegan uh, gave her report into the uh, Bally Murphy case. Uh, and I stood with the families uh, in Moyard Park and I spoke to the news. And I was very privileged because there was a case, if ever there was a case, where the truth was interrogated and the truth came out because if it had been left to the perpetrators of Bally Murphy uh, with regard to the truth, uh, the, the official version would have been that the people on Bally Murphy uh, in 1971 were gunmen and gunwomen. And of course, what came out uh, in Justice Keegan's report, that was uh, absolutely couldn't be further from the truth. So the truth needs to be investigated, absolutely. When it comes to justice, and I think justice is important, I think that the only way of getting the truth, and certainly John Boucher has said this, uh, is that you, you will not get the truth if you just leave it up to the perpetrator to come forward and tell you what they want to know. The truth needs to be interrogated and it needs to be uh, investigated. And the only way to do that is with a criminal, inve uh, criminal investigative uh, way, way forward. That's the only way that it's ever, it's ever going to happen. And obviously the government's command paper calls far short of all that. I suppose for us uh, at the Wave Trauma Centre, and we have been thinking about these issues for a long, 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 long time. And given what I've just said, all those things, trust, community of care, victim centred accountability, truth, prosecution, et cetera, et cetera. For us, there is no better model at the minute than Operation Canova. And it would certainly be our argument. And we're not throwing away the Stormont House Agreement, by the way. We absolutely support the Stormont House Agreement. That's in it. Uh, it wasn't just all about truth and justice. But in this issue of truth and justice, our argument would be, you know, why try to create a different model when we have a model that is working, that is clearly working? Um, as Alison said, uh, I've worked with the families. Uh, I'm one of the victims focus groups, so I'm acknowledging that bias, but that's not there just to rubber stamp what John Boucher does. We actually engage with, with the families, and, and because many of them come to WAVE, I know what they're saying, and it's about... Canova, how they went about their business, how they're approachable, how they have the compassion, how they have the continuity of care, um, how they were upfront whenever there was going to be a story leaked to the press. The uh, John Boucher and his team of detectives would have met with the families and told them this is what's going to come out. So they weren't getting any surprises. And through all of that, over the last three, four years, he has built up um, a lot of trust within the families. And we think uh, that that could be ruled out. And I know that there's legal people here and I've already heard people tell me why it can't be ruled out. Um, but sure, there's ways around things, you know. I mean, I would ask the legal people here to kind of come up with how we can upscale Canova to make it, to make it work. Because it is, it is set for purpose. And, it's, and more importantly, it's ready to go because people like Patsy McAteer, uh, who was buried this morning, uh, just don't have the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for being so dis disciplined as well. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Stephen White. Um, Stephen is a former PSNI Assistant Chief Constable. He's also the chair of the RUC George C Foundation, George Cross Foundation. Sorry. Stephen. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I'm speaking for myself, but um, I wear a number of hats as has already been mentioned by Kieran, I am a human rights commissioner. I am the chairman of the Royal Oscar Constabulary George Cross Foundation, which deals with widows, bereaved parents, many victims, disabled police officers, and so on. I'm also the director of a charity that deals with a security force uh, who have been injured and damaged mentally by uh, working through the troubles. I'm also a retired police officer, as has been mentioned, and it'll be no surprise to anybody that some of the things today that I will say will reflect and reiterate what has been said already by the Human Rights Commission, by the Northern Ireland Retired Police Officers Association. But as I say, I'm speaking mostly uh, for myself. I'm also a citizen of this country, a father and a grandfather, so I have a, an invest, uh, investment in the future. And if the key test of any proposal, whether it be law change, or uh, methodologies for bringing us to reconciliation, to resolve conflict, to build peace, then 
how could you not support that? The question is, will it achieve, will the proposals actually achieve what they are set out to address? Is it victim centered? Does it have accountability? And I would say the model of restorative justice, which many in this room know well about, perhaps give us some of those tests. So let me say a, a few things because I imagine nothing like others have said is going to be particularly new, I'm taken by what Alan said about the, the blah, blah, blah. But like most sensible people, I want an, effect, an effective victim-centered human rights compliant approach to addressing the legacy of the conflict. But someone who was primarily a lawman in his career, I wanted to support the rule of law and comply with international human rights standards. So when I reflect back on the um, responses that the Northern Ireland Retired Police Officers Association put together, I don't see anything that I particularly disagree with. Sometimes there's an emphasis on one aspect as opposed to another, but um, the view is that a police-led inquiry such as Opcanova is the right way to investigate crimes. The Retired Police Officers Association, including myself, we, we don't seek an amnesty. I haven't met a single police officer who has asked for um, a statute of limitations or a statute of limitations or indeed an amnesty. Most police officers feel that if there is evidence, then that evidence must be pursued and a prosecution taken to court. There is, however, a, a perception, and this is where perception and reality sometimes clash, that there's an inbuilt unfairness in relation to how some proposals are worded or directed particularly in relation to the police who keep the records, who are subject to such scrutiny anyway during their, 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 their lifetime in, in uniform, but then that never goes away. The records are always there. There's also sometimes a, a concern that police officers are being equated with terrorists. There's this issue that if you bring us all into the same group and use such terms as combatants, that can be quite offensive. I don't know any police officer who saw himself as going into combat, Yes, you hear uh, words like fighting crime, and we are, we're certainly operating in a militaristic uh, context, but most police officers, as far as I'm concerned, you go to duty uh, every day to protect life, to protect property, yes, to, to solve and detect crimes and so on, but we don't see ourselves as combatants. As I've said before, twice in the last uh, two weeks while speaking at similar events, there's a lot of talk about how police behave and behaved in terms of their use of force or their use of powers or their abuse or overuse of powers. But there's a big issue too about how police are used, how society uses its police. And I simply plead that situational context, understanding of the police officers and particularly their widows. I work very much uh, with widows and bereaved parents. And these proposals have caused so much trauma and concern amongst those groups. As one widow said to me, I always felt that my husband's murder was being wiped onto the carpet. His memory, his duty was being wiped onto the carpet, but now they, want, they don't even want to give me the chance of hoping that perhaps a perpetrator would be identified and brought to court, brought to justice. So there is this concern that uh, by, by exonerating gunmen and bombers, there's an equivalence that police officers and, and soldiers uh, are in the same boat. I'm cutting short because of the, the, the time issue, but I just want to quote perhaps um, a senior colleague who quite recently said, as a lawman, I cannot, I cannot see how ceasing all investigations, criminal, criminal prosecutions and judicial activity, including current and future inquests and civil claims can help the situation. There's something that concerns me greatly when in a liberal democracy, you undermine the rule of law and inhibit it to that extent. So I think, as Alison said, there seems to be a, a concern also that cer certain people's rights are being put um, on a higher tier than others. And certainly there is this concern that police officers um, and their requirement for justice is, is being ignored. So the question I ask myself is why? If I had more time, that's really what I was going to lead up to. What is it that these proposals are actually trying to address? Is it to draw a line? Is it to save money? Certainly, it will save money. Certainly, it will mean that all those resources that are currently being used uh, to deal with the investigations 
and the civil cases and the inquests. So if there's an honesty that that is the purpose, because will it really solve the situation? Will it really promote reconciliation? I think it's about 10 years ago, Kearney asked me to speak at a, a, an event at Queen's and it was for victims in particular. And I made the comment that I don't see myself as a victim. I see myself as a survivor, but boy, do I know a lot of victims. Boy, have I worked with them. And I, I, I continue to do. And as someone who works with victims, the thing I'm going to leave you with is, if you look at the principles and the practices of restorative justice, perhaps there is something in there that we can focus on in terms of a test. When police officers are doing their duty or thinking of planning for an operation, they're always asked to think through a number of things. Is it justified? Is it proportionate? Is it effective? But is it legal? So in terms of restorative justice, and I remember the I'd cry at the time that even in this building, I remember being criticized by some very senior politicians. I was leading on it for the RUC and then PSNI, that you're getting into bed with terrorists. Even the thought of engaging to look at practices that would prevent perhaps mostly young men, but young people getting involved in crime and low level crime initially. But I've actually seen some of the work that's been done preventing young men in particular being radicalized and getting involved with the dissidents. So I'm a great believer in restorative justice if it is done properly. But when you look at the um, checklist of what restorative justice practices are, it talks about making amends for harm. It talks about direct accountability, people taking responsibility. I like the point that Alan raised about there's truth and there's truth. It has to be tested, it has to be investigated, it has to be corroborated as we were saying in policing terms. But in relation to um, the key principles of restorative justice, they're underpinned by a set of values which include honesty, mutual respect, engagement, healing, restoration, personal accountability, collaboration, and problem solving. So I, in a sense, understand what I think the command paper is trying to achieve but the methodology for doing so, to me, think, I, I think it's flawed and it's, it's damned to uh, be unsuccessful. If it is about saving money, if it's about reducing the amount of resources, addressing the past, of course, will it promote reconciliation? Will it bring closure to victims? Will it satisfy the majority of people? Well, I think the answer is clear to everyone. When political parties in this country are all agreeing that it is a, a, a non-starter in a sense, I think that says it all. So thanks for your time. That's really, those are my views. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Stephen. I think there's a number of themes already coming through there. Um, certainly uh, Stephen's point on the equivalence issue, and you saw the numbers earlier on in terms of who will actually benefit from this in terms of state and non-state actors. Um, I think Alan had thrown down a very good challenge to the nerds in the room here, uh, and I'm going to put one nerd on notice to maybe pick up on that, and um, my colleague Daniel Holder. This is this was the question, um, as I speak as a fellow nerd, obviously. Um, uh, this was the question about that nerds should be working up. Well, uh, uh, Operation Canova has has delivered for families. What would it be? What would be required to bring it up to the standards? So, Daniel, that's maybe something we can come back to um, in, in questions. I want to introduce our next speaker. Next speaker is Lieutenant Colonel the Reverend Nicholas Mercer. Nicholas is the rector at Bolton Abbey, and he was the army's um, chief lawyer um, during the Iraq War in two thousand and three. So, thank you very much. Nick. Thank you very much for your introduction and, and um, invitation to this event this afternoon. Um, first of all, it's been very most interesting to hear legal perspectives and then the perspectives from the police. I've been asked to give a military perspective uh, and I've, whilst I haven't been directly involved in Northern Ireland, I have been involved in Iraq and the Overseas Operations Bill, which I think is informative and instructive when it comes to a proposed amnesty into Northern Ireland. First of all, I served in the army for 20 years. I was a military lawyer and I was the chief lawyer in theater for the Iraq war in 2003. I served in Northern Ireland for two years between 95 and 97. And although I was a young officer then, I dealt with criminally, criminal injury compensation as part of my sort of remit. And that meant peculiarly that I met the families of the two last people to be killed in Northern Ireland. Uh, w1 James Bradwell, I went to see his widow in the Tyne and Weir and Bombardier Restrick, I went to see Rita Restrick and her husband in Peterborough. So I feel peculiarly close 
to what I thought was the closing chapter in Northern Ireland. And I must admit, uh, when I heard uh, back in England of the Good Friday Agreement, I was jumping for joy. I could not believe the political dividend that had been yielded uh, from our service in Northern Ireland. The fact that Tony Blair's government was able to bring peace was a monumental achievement, and I jumped for joy. And at the time, I thought a truth and reconciliation type commission was the way forward. It's superficially simple. It neatly closes that chapter. It would take the pressure away from contentious prosecutions. And there had been comfort letters anyway for terrorists under the Good Friday Agreement. In my view, at that time and place, the, the climate was potentially right for an amnesty. After all, they'd had them in France, they'd had them in Spain, and clearly they had them in Chile. However, I've since changed my view, uh, not least because I think politically, with 70% of the population against an amnesty, it's not going to wash. Secondly, I think that Brexit is an act of national self-immolation and has poisoned the political climate, and I'm not sure it can be redeemed without some radical measures. But last year, thanks to the pandemic, I worked extensively on the Overseas Operations Bill. Uh, luckily, I had less parish work to do, so I could work a lot with NGOs. And indeed, I advised the House of Bishops on how to oppose the act in the House of Lords. And I think this has, is instructive because in effect, it's another form of amnesty for the proposed amnesty here. First and foremost, the government narrative was, was, was uh, misleading. The bill was introduced with malafides. It says in the Conservative Party manifesto that this bill was designed to prevent vexatious prosecutions. There was the remarkable event in the House of Commons when Johnny Mercer, no relation by the way, was asked to name a vexatious prosecution. He couldn't because there are none. Secondly, as an eyewitness to the abuse of Iraqi prisoners and someone who I think has exposed rendition in Iraq, my criminal complaints were certainly not vexatious and I took issue with Baroness Goldie over categorizing them as such. In other words, a false narrative was created by the government for various nefarious political objectives. But there are a couple of things that came out of it as well, which I think are instructive. First of all, torture was really the main thrust of our argument when it came to opposing the bill. In other words, there can be no amnesty for torturers. As we've heard under Article 3 of the Convention on Human Rights, it has to be investigated fully. And the UN Rapporteur on Torture made it absolutely clear there can be no amnesty. If that holds good for the Overseas Operations Bill, it holds good for Northern Ireland as well. You couldn't split the two issues. Secondly, although we were dealing with war crimes under international humanitarian law in the Overseas Operations Bill, the same applies under domestic law through the Convention on Human Rights. In other words, under Article 2, there is a requirement to have an effective investigation. You can't have an amnesty. So the same principle applies here. And as Amnesty International said, we cannot allow those responsible for murder, torture, and other grave human rights violations to be placed above the law and above accountability. Absolutely spot on. But peculiarly, there's another dimension to what I've got to say, and that's the moral. Uh, and normally I would, wouldn't really sort of go into this domain, particularly in my, my life as a lawyer, but I read an article in The Spectator by Douglas Murray uh, called Bloody Liar. And it was about, he'd been following the Savile inquiry with great, in great detail. And the article is immensely powerful. And he describes the wall of silence put up by British soldiers. Uh, and he says they include not only unapologetic killers, but unrelenting liars. And he talks about soldier F who was shown to have killed four people. One of them, Patrick Doherty, shot through the buttock as he was crawling away. Another one, Barney McGuigan, waving a white handkerchief, was shot in the head. I sat down and discussed this with a number of my military friends. I've left the army 10 years ago, but it included a company commander from Bloody Sunday and a two-star general who was staying with us in the rectory in North Yorkshire. And we all agreed, no one could disagree that it was morally offensive not to hold people accountable 
for those sort of acts on the battlefield or what, however you choose to describe it. Shooting someone through the head, waving a white handkerchief, a man crawling away, shooting him through the buttocks. It's simply unconscionable. And I bet if I sat down with my namesake, Johnny Mercer, and said, as a battery commander, as a former artillery officer, would you accept any of your soldiers behaving themselves in such a way? The only answer could be no. As Douglas Murray said, British soldiers should be held to a higher standard than terrorists. And I agree. We came into Northern Ireland to uphold the rule of law. We should have done the same in Iraq. We did neither in both fields of conflict. And the third thing I want to say is uh, complicity, state complicity in murder. It seems to me that one of the ironies in all of this is that the government's fingerprints may be over some of the crime scenes. Now, I don't know, of course, I don't, because no one can get hold of the documents. But going back to what Dominic Raab said about international legal norms and upholding human rights standards, if we criticize the Saudi estate for complicity in the murder of Khashoggi and ask for accountability, it's a, again a supreme irony that we effectively propose to legislate to cover up our own complicity in the murder of citizens on UK soil. I appreciate that it's very difficult to find a way forward in this. I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't been part of the bill team and all the rest of it because I get on with normal parish life. But I've got a few proposals. One is a proposed amnesty where all parties agree in a particular situation that they will be happy for there to be an amnesty in their individual case. It's, it wouldn't seem to me unreasonable if both sides agreed that, that was possible that that could be done. Secondly, I think the state should assume responsibility where it has inadvertently broken the law. I understand that the yellow card in Northern Ireland was for a long time legally incorrect, giving soldiers the right to open fire when in fact it would be unlawful. And if that was the case and someone was killed, that seems to me a standalone case. Also the five techniques. The state obviously gave illegal instructions when it came to the interrogation of terrorists or innocent people, whoever it happened to be. And the state should put its hands up to that and say, we got it wrong and we will compensate in those circumstances. In Iraq, the five techniques manifested themselves in interrogation centers and the British government have hidden behind the vexatious complaint narrative rather than admitting that it got the law wrong. And that seems to me wholly wrong in itself. I have every sympathy for heat of battle situations for soldiers. Some of them, many of them are put in very difficult situations and we shouldn't underestimate that. Uh, I don't propose an amnesty for murder, but reduce sentencing to the point of no sentence, found guilty, but no imprisonment or whatever. And finally, no amnesty where there is state collusion in murder. It is simply untenable in a country that founds itself on the rule of law and human rights. I just conclude by saying I'm not optimistic. Uh, one of the things that came to my, my field of vision was widened considerably when I left the military. Uh, and I read a book by a man called Ian Cobain called Cruel Britannia. And I, I'm a footnote in that narrative. But in all the post-colonial campaigns from 1945 to date, the British state has effectively covered up its crimes. So Kenya, Malaya, Cyprus, Northern Ireland, and so on and so forth. It's done remarkably well in Iraq at the same time. I actually am not optimistic about this. I think there will be a skillful statescraft will be employed or indeed a cover up itself. And the only way in British constitution that these things come to light is that everyone's dead or in a nursing home and some brave young lawyer picks up the cudgels once again and only then is it deemed acceptable. But to conclude, in my view, there is an overwhelming political, legal and moral case for abandoning the proposed amnesty. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, so we were uh, originally going to um, finish up at 13.35. That was primarily to let MLAs get back. We're not going to do that. I'm going to stretch it out a bit. I'm conscious that there may be some people here who need um, to, to rejoin debates, but this I think it's too important not to have a, a decent Q&A, so bear with me on that. Um, 
the way that we're going to work this is I think my, my colleague, Dr. Bryson, is going to, she's looking at the online questions that are coming in. And in order to make sure we capture it, I, I also have a roving mic. So basically, um, I think probably the sensible way to do it is if you're answering a question, and um, you probably come up here and that way and you can capture it here on the mic just to make sure that we're we're properly mic'd up. And just while people are, are thinking, um, I'd maybe ask my colleague, Daniel Holder, to take up Alan McBride's um, query to get us started rolling on what would be required. I can give you the roving mic for that one if you want to stay seated or you come up here, whatever. Okay. So people can be thinking about their questions as, as Daniel speaks. Okay, thank you. I'll go and sit back down. This is um, working. Yeah, I suppose one of the things initially to say is government, even in the command paper, is constantly talking up Canova whilst proposing essentially the opposite within the command paper. But in terms of the issues around Canova and upscaling it and it being a much broader model, I mean, there's no doubt that within Canova and the independent reports have shown this, every effort has been made to make it Article 2 compliant. Where there's a limitation is that really it's not? It's because it's not set up on a legislative basis, which means it's vulnerable to interference at any particular point, whether that's removing its finance, it can't choose its own cases um, in terms of, does it have the powers to publish its own reports? For example, so there's a whole range of things you'd need to um, address in order to set it up on a legislative basis. And if you sit down and think, well, what would that look like? What would, if you set up Canova on a, on a sort of legislative basis, a, uh, an investigative unit with full criminal powers with all the guarantees over its own finance, its own independence, its, its staffing, um, its powers, of course, ability to produce its own reports and things like that, then we're very conscious that we've already had this discussion over many, many years as to what that would look like. And what we ended up with was essentially the model of the HAU um, within the Stormont House Agreement. That is essentially an independent criminal justice an investigative mechanism like Canova, but set up on a, on a legislative basis so it can engage in all sort of the, the relevant cases and discharge powers with requisite independence and produce reports and pass files on for prosecution. So really the hurdle in upscaling it would be um, setting it up on a legislative basis, but not reinventing the wheel in the sense that that's work's already been done. That was what the HAU was to be. But there is a second big problem presented by the command paper, which places a question mark over, over all of this in the sense of could you have, I mean, if you look at what has made Canova, and a number of people have said this already, successful, it's been having full police powers. That's how it's managed to gather 50,000 pages of evidence. I think the Secretary of State recently said to the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee that um, Canova hadn't actually had to use its police powers now far be it from me to suggest the Secretary of State's misled Parliament, but that appears to be entirely untrue. It um, has used police powers over a particular period of time, and the ports throughout and things like that would, would, would show that. The question is, though, the triggering point for using police powers is when you are investigating a crime. Sometimes you need to reach the investigative powers and things like that. You need to reach the threshold of a very serious crime. If you introduce... Um, a statute of limitations amnesty. It's extremely difficult to see how a body could work, and this is a, a sort of issue that's very much open to question, could actually exercise police powers to investigate crimes when effectively you can't investigate crimes because those crimes have been de facto legalized through, through a statute of limitations or, or an amnesty. Would the thresholds and all the safeguards that come with the exercise of police powers actually be met? So that's totally uncharted territory. So. Is that nerdy enough for you? Yeah, I think that's probably <laughs> not to be getting on with her, I think. Yes. Um, I think we'll start off with taking questions from the room here in real time. And Daniel, if you wouldn't mind doing the roving mic for that. And as I say, for the speakers who want to answer it, if you just come up here and then we'll make sure you're captured on the mic. So anyone in the room who, yes, I see Paul Crawford's hand up here, man in the white shirt. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, not so much a question as a, a number of observations on what's been said and to thank each and every one of, of the speakers who have all made very followed interesting points. I'd like to say straight off that my own personal position is that the command paper is wrong in its entirety. It should be scrapped. Um, there should be no, absolutely no amnesty. The structures for conflict transformation were agreed 
not only in the Good Friday Agreement, but in the Stormont House Agreement. I'm wondering, do people agree that the actual issue is that the government stroke governments have almost criminally failed in their duty to implement agreements that they have signed up to consistently and repeatedly, not just with the Stormont House. To that end, I find myself asking what would be the point of accepting them signing up to do anything else when they have proven that they cannot and or will not deliver. We are, I think, seven, eight years down the road since Stormont House. Stormont House offered um, a wee bit to everybody, basically, you know, with, with the ICIR, the HIU, etc. cetera. Um, moving on from that, I would say that um, I speak not as a victim. My father, my aunt, my cousin, some of my best friends, my community, and by my community, I mean right across this community, um, they were the victims. I'm a survivor. I'm a person with lived experience, a very unfortunate lived experience. And it's from that perspective that I make these comments. I disagree that Operation Canova, and I've met John Boucher a couple of times, it hasn't delivered. It has received general goodwill and support. And I haven't heard a lot of criticism of its methods, but I've not seen the end result. I've not seen anybody in court. So to that end, it cannot be said that it's delivered. And it hasn't reached that point yet. Perhaps it never will. I think it is absolutely not and should not be a replacement for the structures agreed in the Stormont House Agreement. I've heard truth recovery mentioned many times, and I would call that information recovery. There can be many truths, and the truth of the victim maker will be different to the truth of the victim. And although they are quite likely to be in conflict, they both may remain the truth from the teller's perspective. However, uh, information recovery under the structures of the Stormont House Agreement, I agree, should be absolutely verifiable. Can't just take somebody's version and go, thank you very much, I'll toddle along. Absolutely, information recovery should be verifiable. I don't think it is uh, reasonable or um, I just don't think it, it is achievable or whatever the word is I'm seeking for escapes me, but to know the individual victim maker. With all of the conflict related incidents, whether it be resulting in death, injury, or whatever. Um, all of the organizations, both state and non-state, had command structures. And therefore, the people who were the victim makers were not just the people directly involved, but the people who provided logistical and other support. I am disappointed to still hear people using the word terrorists in a conflict uh, resolution environment. And I'll tell you why, and it's just my personal position. I don't refer to anyone as terrorists. And it's as simple as this. My, my personal position is that calling someone a terrorist generally just refers to the other side. Um, I'm very proud to have lived all of my life in West Belfast. And my life experience is that I don't call anybody terrorist, but if I was going to put that label on anybody, it would be on the state forces. It would be on the state forces who killed many of my community, one of my relatives. And in actual fact, in, in relation to the five torture techniques, I was actually subjected to one of them myself. And I've 
never been on the wrong side of the law. So those were a few points. I'll finish on this, which I think is two completely relevant short points. On what Alan said about the tokenism in regard to victim centered, absolutely agree. And I don't think they should, anything should just be victim centered. I think it should be victim led as in victims should be involved in the construction uh, stage and, and form real roles. Finally, my real point, uh, my final very important point is that I think that this command paper, far from drawing a line onto the past, actually creates possibly the conditions where conflict could actually start again. And it sends out a completely negative message that you just hang about and hey, it's fine. That sends a very, very bad signal out. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that, Paul. Any, any other questions from people here in the room um, before we go to see if there's um, online um, questions? So anyone, and just if you have a question, just let us know which speaker you want to address it. So anyone in the room here got a particular question they want to address to a particular speaker? Okay, Anna, you seeing some stuff on online? I can't see it, so you'll have to read it out to me. Yeah, Karen, there's a question here from Neil Farris. Um, I think it's Daniel that this will be directed to. It's following on from the discussion in Canova. Um, he's asking how can the rights of those found guilty in HIU style uh, reports be protected? He says it's not the role of police officers in a HIU body to make findings as such of guilt. Daniel, I don't know if you want to. Um, well, maybe open to the panel members to res respond as well. I suppose the answer to that is there are a number of obligations under the ECHR and Article 2, Article 3 investigations as to what investigative bodies where there are potential breaches of Article 2 have to include uh, within the scope of their investigations and hence within the findings of, of their reports. Clearly individual suspects um, do get a level of anonymity in, in reports if there's not a um, process that can be a judicial process that can can be gone through but that nevertheless doesn't absolve the investigative duty to actually um, investigate um, responsibility um, for death. Okay can I, can I ask a question myself to Nicholas here um, it's one that, that um, occurred to me and it's just in terms of we heard Stephen White saying earlier that in terms of the former police colleagues that he hasn't heard one former police colleague arguing in favor of this amnesty. Um, I had an interesting meeting actually with um, uh, a number of British Army liaison officers who were suggesting that there are significant misgivings in the GB based uh, Br British Army veterans community around this as well. Because what the way we've sort of this side of the water, if you're reading the English media, you would think that veterans in GB speak with one voice. We already know that significant numbers of veterans who are Northern Ireland based have very serious misgivings. But I just wonder from your point of view, Nicholas, what are you picking up? What's the views of, of veterans, GB-based veterans with regard to this amnesty? Well, I'm afraid I don't have sufficient contact to, to give any meaningful answer to that. It's just that when we have sat down, I, I don't mix with a huge number of ex-military, but where I do and we discuss it, uh, particularly in the context of Bloody Sunday, we all agree that it would be unconscionable for someone to be exonerated from a crime of that gravity. Um, uh, as I said in my, in my piece. Okay, fair enough. Stephen, you wanted to come in on that? Thanks, Karen. Just to make a couple of comments. First of all, in relation to the uh, Daniels um, point, I'm saying something which I think is so obvious I shouldn't need to say it, uh, and certainly not to people in this room, but there's a difference between investigating and adjudicating. Mm. So an investigator's role is to gather the evidence, the truth, that those who are giving the information uh, claim to be the truth, corroborate that, weigh it up, and if there's evidence beyond reasonable doubt, or at least uh, enough to take to public prosecutions. That, so that is one of the concerns. Uh, and I, I say that in hope that everyone agrees, you cannot be the investigator and the adjudicator. There has to be a, a, a test. And in relation to the, the issue around no police officer that I have ever come across, or indeed it's the stated position, of retired police officers that nobody should be giving a, a, an amnesty or, or a statute of limitation shouldn't allow the, the belief that you are exonerated or free from uh, any uh, repercussions for your actions. Uh, so 
But there is a perception, you're absolutely right, whether it be through the media or through particular advocates, that in particular military uh, soldiers who served here, particularly in the 1970s, but since then, 80s and so on, that it's not so case that they, that they shouldn't be investigated. It's the fact that they're investigated more than once. And I think that is a real issue that there's a perception that, okay, they, they weren't found guilty the first time. So let's have another go with another body or another group. Now, I don't particularly subscribe to that because if new evidence is uh, found, then clearly it needs to be brought before the courts. But I think that's, again, one of those perception things where, as you know, army records exist. The structures are there to re-scrutinize old decisions and old papers. And having been investigated once, twice or three times, it's reinvestigated. So I think that has caused um, some issues. Sure, Nicholas wants to come in on that, yeah. I mean, that's a really interesting point. The trouble is, if it isn't investigated properly the first time, you come back. I think when I served in Northern Ireland in 95 to 97, we just came in in the aftermath of private Clegg case. And there was, for the first time, a, a realisation that the army was going to be held accountable for every shot fired. And I know as the legal department, we got that. But we had really struggled to explain that to senior military personnel that that age of accountability was upon us. And I suspect before that, I mean, I picked up a copy of the Widgery report traveling to America once, and that it simply, it simply wasn't the case. So we were in this rather unfortunate position. And I think the lawyers got it first. And I think when we took that into Iraq, we realized that we were going to be held accountable for each and every action we took and how we treated prisoners, but the army still hadn't caught up with that. I think it probably has now, but the statecraft has caught up with it too. Okay, thank you, Nicholas. And anything else coming in there on the online questions that I need to pick up on? No. Um, any other questions from the floor? Now, I'm going to give our speakers, if they want, um, I can give you another um, 60 seconds, and then I'm going to hand over to my, my colleague Ronan from the, um, the Bingham Centre to do the concluding remarks. But any, any, anything, the speakers, yes, Alison wants to get in? Yeah, I'm solely responsible for us running out of time, so I, I'm almost hesitant to say anything. But um, just coming back to Canova, as somebody who has a human rights background but also looked closely at Canova, perhaps I could just say one thing. Canova is not being suggested as a model for legacy process generally. Um, Canova came about and once established by John Boucher under his leadership has been Article 2 compliant. But there remains a problem with the funding, with the way in which the cases were referred to him in the first place. So I don't think anyone's saying just upscale Canova. But if you want to know what an Article 2 investigation is, go to John Boucher and he'll tell you. But what came before Canova being set up is very far from ideal and that hasn't changed yet. Okay, that's a very, very important corrective. Thank you, Alison. Any of our other speakers want to, um, before I hand over to Ronan here for concluding remarks, anybody else want to chip in? I mean, I'll, I'll say one last point. I mean, it's, um, thanks for everyone for, for coming along here. One thing that those of us who work in the model building, we've been at this for years, you know, um, and I know there are some victims who have been campaigning and working on this for 40 and 50 years in some instances. Um, I, I get Alan's tiredness around this. We've been around these houses. Um, I think all of us who are working in this space, we've no choice. We just have to keep battering on at it, you know, because we, we just have to keep at it. The, the, the frustrating thing, I think, for, for the nerds like myself who work on it, is that there are fixes there. You know, there is a way in which this could be done in a rule of law compliant manner um, that I think for us at least would keep... Um, all actors, state and non-state actors, out of prison, since that seems to be a driver for this government. We just have to accept that reality, and they've got an 80-seat majority. So there's a possibility, and, and I recognise that's very difficult for some victims to hear who want people to serve their two years. I think that's, I totally understand that, but this government has an 80-seat majority, and we think there's a pathway through all of this, and there's a pathway through all of this which can uphold the rule of law, which let, let the courts run, let the civil actions run, let the inquest run. You could establish a mechanism, I suppose, whether you call it a historical investigations unit or whatever you call it, but with proper Article 2 compliant powers to get to the truth, you can do all of this stuff. And you can include some of the things that Stephen was talking about there, engaging with restorative principles. I mean, one of the things that in, in, in other work, and you, and you heard the UN Special Robert talk, talking about it as well, this stuff around the role of apologies and statements of acknowledgement 
um, a, a little known bit of the Stormont House Agreement. Also, there's a paragraph in there about um, the notion that in, a, in the context of all of this other work being done, where you would have um, Article 2 compliant investigations, where you would have a process wherein um, ex-combatants or state actors could provide truth um, to families, knowing that it would never be um, result in a prosecution, oral history process, a big picture way of pulling it all together. In, that, in the context of that, there is also a role um, for the state and the non-state actors to engage in acts of apology and, and, and statements of acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And in, in the work that we've been doing around that, like, there's an appetite for that as well. There's a willingness in it, it before this wrecking command paper came in, there was actually, there was a space for some real creativity to be done. That's the, that's the deep frustration I think for, but having said all of that, we just have to keep battering on. And with that one, I'm gonna hand over you for concluding yeah, remarks. Of course, Anya, of course. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I suppose it's just to reiterate the point again about the fact that, you know, we've been doing this for a long, 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 long time. And I can remember, um, uh, I think it was Barry McGrory uh, some time ago, whenever legacy proposals were being mentioned, I think it was under maybe Stormont House or whatever. And he was cautioning uh, that we had to manage the expectations of victims, uh, you know, in, in, in case they, they expected too much from a process and then they were disappointed because it didn't deliver. And I can remember at the time listening to that and thinking as someone who's worked for victims and survivors for the last 20 odd years that for me it was never about managing expectations. It was always about raising expectations, actually raising expectations that something could happen that would actually make a tangible bit of difference for them because everywhere they went and every process they've been involved in, it was just disappointment and failure after disappointment and failure. And after a while, uh, you just start to lose hope. So I am tired, you know, I am tired having this conversation, it does sound like blah, 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 most of the time. Uh, and I want that to, uh, to finish. I want, I want something to happen this time. Uh, I suppose the reason that I'm personally in favour of Operation Canova is because I'm seeing it working. I'm seeing it working for families. I'm seeing it delivering. Uh, and I know Paul said it hasn't delivered. There's 31 files with the Crown, with the Public Prosecution Service at the moment. The fact that it hasn't delivered has nothing to do with Canova. It's actually to do with the, the Public Prosecution Service. But you're right in that there's no weapon brought to court or no weapon prosecuted. I get that. Um, but, you know, there is, uh, people are tired. And I'll finish with this because this was a really big year for me this year. Uh, and it was a big year because my daughter turned 30 this year. And the reason that's significant is because her mother was 29 years old when she was killed. Uh, my daughter has outlived her mother in terms of uh, her life years. And, uh, and I do want her to be, uh, you know, an old woman uh, before uh, these things are, are settled. And in the case of the Shanklebaum, yes, we got some truth and we got some justice, but there was a hell of a lot of other questions that had to be uh, asked about that day, which have never been brought to light. So let's finish with that. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Karen. I'm very grateful to all our speakers for making this such uh, an interesting and informative debate. Um, this is the first time that the Bingham Centre has hosted an event in Northern Ireland, and I'm really grateful for working with Queen's University and the Committee on the Administration of Justice for making it such a success. Uh, the Bingham Centre exists to promote the rule of law domestically and internationally. Uh, one of the specific things that we do is investigate the government's proposals for legislation and scrutinize them from a rule of law perspective. And I'd just like to reflect on the various comments that we've heard today. Looking at these proposals through different prisms, we can see that there is unanimous disagreement with them. If we look at the, the constitutional law perspective, the separation of powers means that we have a legislature, we have the courts, and we have the executive. With these proposals, we completely remove the courts. So in terms of structure and constitutional law, nerdishness, it, it doesn't work, it takes it away. From the rule of law perspective, the principle of legality means we're all subject to the law. Under these proposals, we are not all subject to the law because there is impunity for those who have broken the law. Um, as Alison has talked about the human rights perspective, Article 2, Article 3, Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights, these are all undermined by these proposals. If we look at basic decency, common sense, and the rights of victims, we've heard again from victims' representatives that these perspectives, this, these proposals will undermine respect for victims. If we cast our mind back to what Paula Bradshaw said at the start from the political perspective, so looking at it through the prism of politics, there is unanimous hostility in Northern Ireland by all the main political parties against these proposals. 
um, cast our mind back again to this, the UN Special Rapporteur. From the international law perspective, he also disagrees with these proposals. They are the antithesis of what respect for human rights international law should be. From all these perspectives, these, these proposals are wrong. But I have a, a, a harsh message and on the off chance that anyone is a fan of wrestling, I will use the words of Dwayne The Rock Johnson. It doesn't matter what you think. These proposals are proposals which are going through Westminster and the proposals of the UK government. It doesn't really matter what we say here, even though we're unanimous against these proposals, because what matters is there's two. There's only two possible routes to uh, to criticise them or sorry to have an effective response to them. The first is through the courts, and there is an attempt to have a judicial review against these proposals at the moment. And the second is influencing the government and the Westminster Parliament because it is the government who will introduce these proposals into Westminster and the Westminster Parliament which will vote upon them. Now, Nicholas has already mentioned the Overseas Operations Bill. Um, which is a precursor, so to speak, of these proposals, because that was an attempt to give impunity to um, just the armed forces um, in respect of overseas operations. And that does provide a model for influencing Westminster, influencing Parliament, but that is uh, the way to do it. So even though it's a very harsh message and a very conscious, it's a harsh message whenever there's unanimous um, disagreement with the, with the proposals here today, but that is the way to do it, to influence Westminster, to influence the UK government, to persuade them that these pr proposals are, are wrong. So as I say, I'm very grateful to all our speakers today and I'm um, very happy to be a, a involved in this discussion today. Thank you very much.